Today we're going to look at a special function known as the Clausen function of order 2. And since it's called something of order 2, well there must be one of order 3 and 4 and 5 and so on and so forth. And yes there is. But we're going to only look at this one. The other ones are just generalizations. Not that they're not interesting, but this is a good starting place. Okay, so this function, which is denoted by CL sub 2 of theta, is defined as negative the integral from 0 to theta of the natural log of the absolute value of 2 sine x over 2 dx. So let's notice that it has to be defined in terms of an integral. Or maybe it doesn't have to, but here it's defined in terms of an integral. This maybe raises a broader question of why do we look at special functions in the first place? And I think probably one of the most compelling reasons is that there are only a couple of different classes of functions that you learn in calculus class. You know, like polynomials, trig functions, rational functions, exponential functions, logarithmic functions, and then combinations of those. But those functions are actually in the minority. The great majority of functions cannot be defined so simply. They must be defined in terms of either power series, like the Airy function, which appeared on the channel a while ago, or in terms of integrals, like this one, or like the dilogarithm, which has also been on the channel. So I think maybe it should be a little bit of a mind shift that most functions have complicated definitions. Okay, so let's start with the following claim, which is essentially the Fourier series representation of this Clausen function. So it's in fact equal to the sum as n goes from one to infinity of sine n theta over n squared. So we'll derive this but as a consequence of this, we'll actually get a nice integral identity, which I think is maybe tricky on its own. Okay, so I've put a little box up there because we're gonna recall a certain trigonometric identity which will be important, and that is the double angle formula. So let's recall that sine of, I'll maybe call this theta at this point, but it's not related to this theta, so sine of, 2 theta is in fact equal to 2 sine theta times cos theta. And then cos 2 theta is equal to, well, it's like a difference of squares of the trig functions. So it's cos squared theta minus sine squared theta. Okay, so anyway, like I said, that's where we're going to start, or that's one of the first things that we'll use. Another thing that we'll use is Euler's formula for the complex exponential. But we won't state that over there, we'll just start with that in our calculation. Okay, so we'll begin by considering the following object, 1 minus e to the minus ix. So that'll be 1 minus cosine of negative x plus i times sine of negative x. Again, like I alluded to, using Euler's formula for the complex exponential. But we can use the fact that cosine is an even function to write this as cosine of x, and that sine is an odd function to write that as minus sine of x. Okay, so now expanding this out, keeping in mind that we get a minus from here and a minus from here, we'll have the following object. So we'll have 1 minus cosine of x, that'll be like our real part, and then plus i times the sine of x. And now you might wonder, well, why did I put those double angle formulas on the board? Well, that's because I'm about to use them. And I'm about to use them with theta is equal to x over 2 to expand each of these terms. Okay, so let's get at that. The first thing that we'll do is quite trivial. We'll take this 1 and rewrite it as cosine squared plus sine squared. So that'll give us cosine squared x over 2 plus sine squared x over 2. And let's do a little bit of color coding here. So I'll underline this in red and I'll underline this in red. And then I'll expand this cosine x out as well. That'll give me minus cosine squared of x over 2 plus sine squared of x over 2 because we need to be careful to distribute the minus sign through, which we did. Okay, so that comes from this right here. Then we'll do the same thing for the sine term. 
So that'll give me plus 2i times sine x over 2 times cosine x over 2. So that's from the expansion of this. Okay, great. So now let's see if we can cancel some stuff, and indeed we can. So this cosine squared and this cosine squared will cancel. And then after that, this sine squared and this sine squared double up. So let's rewrite that. That leaves us with 2 sine squared x over 2 and then plus 2 times i times sine x over 2 times cosine x over 2. But looking at this, that's just begging us to factor out a greatest common factor. And that greatest common factor is 2 times sine x over 2. And before we fill in what's left over, notice we're like working towards a nice place because notice this 2 sine x over 2 is appearing right here. Okay, so anyway, what's left over? Well, we have sine x over 2 plus i times cosine x over 2. But notice this is sine something plus i times cosine something, whereas if we were to write this in terms of Euler's formula, we would need the real part to be a cosine and the imaginary part to be a sine. But now we're going to use like one more little identity here, and that is that sine of pi over 2 minus theta is equal to cosine, and then Likewise, cosine of pi over 2 minus theta is equal to sine. And that'll do it. So let's rewrite that. So we have 2 times sine of x over 2. And then this will now be sine of pi minus x over 2. Sorry, that should be cosine of pi minus x over 2 plus i times sine of pi minus x over 2. But now we can push those two things together into a complex exponential. We do have a 2 sine x over 2 out front, and then an e to the i pi minus x over 2. Okay, great. So let's maybe bring that up to the top, and then we'll keep going. Okay, so this is where we left ourselves off. But let's recall that we want this 2 times sine x over 2 inside of a logarithm. So let's take a logarithm of both sides. So that'll leave us with the natural log of 1 minus e to the minus ix equals, and now I'll use a logarithm formula for a product, thinking about this term, which is like kind of our goal term, times this complex exponential. So let's see, the logarithm of this first term, well, that'll just be simply log of 2 times sine x over 2. And then since a log turns a product into a sum, we'll have plus the logarithm of the next term, which is i times pi minus x over 2. And you might say, well, couldn't we have another copy of 2 times pi times i because of the fact that we've got multiple branches of the logarithm? But I think that's okay because we only want this term right here, which means well, we're going to disregard the imaginary part by taking the real part, which means that part won't really matter at all. Okay, so now let's flip this equation and get what we need. So we'll have the logarithm of 2 times sine of x over 2 is now equal to this log minus this imaginary number. But like I said, we want to get rid of the imaginary part, so we'll do that by putting the real part operator. So this is the real part of the log of 1 minus e to the minus ix. Okay, great. But now I'd like to rewrite this a little bit, and I can rewrite this logarithm via an integral, and that's exactly what we'll do. So this will be the real part of so now it'll be minus the integral from 0 to e to the minus ix of 1 over 1 minus u du. So you can just check that that totally works. Taking the antiderivative of that, we get minus natural log of 1 minus u. Then we plug in the bounds of integration, and everything shapes up. Next up, we'll take this term right here, and maybe I'll bring it off to the side, and we'll expand it as a geometric series. We use this trick so many times that, well, it must be a pretty important trick. So we'll write 1 over 1 minus u as 
the sum as n goes from, I'm gonna write it one to infinity of u to the n minus one. So it's just shifted a little bit from the standard, but I think that'll be most useful here. Okay, so let's see, now we have minus the sum as n goes from one up to infinity of the real part operator applied to the integral from zero up to e to the minus i x of u to the n minus one du. Okay, so I think that's looking pretty good. So that'll be minus the sum as n goes from one to infinity, and now we have the real part of, well, taking the antiderivative here will give us u to the n over n, applying the upper and lower bounds will give us e to the minus i n x over n. Okay, great. But now using Euler's formula, which maybe we'll recall over here one more time, we have e to the minus i n x equals, well, it'll be cos n x minus i times sine n x. So that means this cosine term right here is the real part. So that means if we extract the real part, we simply have minus the sum as n goes from one to infinity of cos n x over n. Okay, good. So that's not totally done yet. That just gives us essentially the expansion of our integrand over here, but it is almost there. Okay, so we just got done deriving the following formula. I moved the minus sign to the other side, so I think that's okay. So now let's notice that CL2 of theta, in other words, this Clausen function of order two, is simply the antiderivative or the integral of this from zero to theta. So we have the integral from zero to theta of the log of two times sine x over two dx, but that'll just be equal to minus the sum as n goes from one to infinity of Let's see, one over n times the integral from zero up to, so that should be theta, theta of cos nx dx. But it's not too tricky to check the value of this integral, and we'll see that it's exactly sine of n times theta over n. So these two n's like double up to n squared, leaving us with, let's see, well, oh, this minus sign is gone because of our formula, so that's a bit of a typo. And we have the sum as n goes from one to infinity of sine of n times theta over n squared as needed. Okay, so I think that's pretty good. Now, as promised, I want to maybe look at another derivation of the Fourier series for this Clausen function. And notice that when comparing it to this, we get a nice integral identity. So we just got done using one method to find the Fourier expansion of this Clausen function, and now we're gonna use the definition of the Fourier series. Then when we match these, we'll get a nice integral identity. So let's recall that this Clausen function can be expanded as a constant term, and then cosine terms and sine terms, where we've got nice integral formulas for those coefficients. And we're only going to focus on the bn coefficient because that's what shows up here. And the bn coefficient is 1 over pi, and then the integral from minus pi to pi of sine n theta times this Clausen function evaluated at theta. But really, just whatever function you're finding in the Fourier series would go there. Okay, so now let's use this integral definition of the Clausen function to do this. So that'll bring a minus sign out front, and now we'll have a double integral. So it'll be minus pi up to pi of, now it'll be the integral from zero to theta. We have sine in theta and then the log of two times sine x over two dx d theta. So something like that. And now we're gonna do a little bit of a trick which I'll leave as a homework exercise, but we're gonna change this to an integral from zero to pi by multiplying by two. Of course, it's because there's some sort of evenness going on in there, but it's not quite so easy because we have a double integral. Okay, next up, we'll change the order of integration. And I think the best way to do that is with a picture. So let's make a little uh, set of axes down here. We'll have an x theta axis. 
we know that we need to go theta between zero and pi, so let's put a pi there. And then x will need to go from zero to theta. So let's see, that'll be something like this. So that is the line theta equals x or x equals theta. Okay, so we're integrating over that region. So now if we change the order of integration, we'll need to know that theta now goes between x and pi. So that'll be our way of changing the order of integration. So anyway, that's gonna leave us something like this. We have minus two over pi, and then the integral from, it'll still be zero to theta, but now it's the x integral from zero to theta, and now the integral from theta up to pi of, well, it's the same integrand, so sine n theta, then the natural log of, well, it's two sine, x by two, and then now it's d theta dx. Okay, good. But now let's look at our innermost integral here. Our innermost integral has something to do with theta, and this is the only part of our function that has something to do with theta, and I just realized that should have been an x right there. Okay, great. So now let's take the antiderivative. So the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine, and we'll pick up a one over n because of this n in the denominator right there. Okay, so we'll use the minus sign to cancel this minus sign, leaving us with two over pi. Then we have the integral from zero to pi of, well, I'm gonna write this as two over n times pi. And now it'll be cosine of n theta evaluated at pi. So that actually turns into minus one to the n, interestingly enough. And then from that, we'll subtract cosine of n theta evaluated at x. So that's gonna be minus cosine of n x. And then we multiply that by the natural log of two times sine of x over two dx. And now I'm gonna stop the calculation of that integral right there because now we're at something which I think is fairly tricky. I'm not sure how you would do this directly, but comparing it to this over here, keeping in mind that we should get one over n squared, we know that the value of this integral is one over n squared. So I think that's a pretty cool result. It's this kind of backwards way of finding a value for this pretty gnarly looking integral. Okay, so if you've stuck around this long, thank you. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, maybe consider subscribing. It would really help us out a lot. And that's a good place to stop.